Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Welcome to Ancestral Health Today. I'm Todd Becker. We're starting a new feature on the podcast called Second Look, where we replay selected talks from past Ancestral Health Symposium conferences that we think will interest you. Today's Second Look talk happens to be one that I gave in 2014 at the AHS meeting in Berkeley. The title is Myopia, a Modern Yet Reversible Disease. Myopia is also called nearsightedness. It's a refractive defect of the eye where close-up objects are in focus, but more distant objects appear blurred. So glasses or contacts are typically prescribed to correct the condition. Although in reality, they don't actually correct the underlying problem. They're just a crutch that aids you in seeing more clearly but often they end up making the problem worse and stronger lenses are needed. I wore glasses for my own nearsightedness starting in high school. And over time, the eye doctor kept increasing the strength of the prescription until I discovered how to get rid of my glasses when I was in my 40s. The first part of the talk is about the increasing prevalence and causes of myopia, including the underlying biology of how the eye becomes myopic by increasing in axial length, mainly due to environmental factors such as poor vision hygiene, things like spending too much time reading and looking at screens up close and not enough time looking at things in the distance. The second half of the talk builds upon this biological understanding to reverse the process. I describe in detail how to use an active focusing technique to reverse myopia and restore normal vision. I adapted this method from research and practices used by others, but I developed the specific active focusing technique myself. I first wrote about my success and the active focusing approach in 2010 on my blog, Getting Stronger. It's one of many applications of a general biological principle known as hormesis, which is the judicious application of low-dose stress to make the body and metabolism more resilient in many different ways. The talk you're about to watch or listen to on the podcast is about reversing myopia or nearsightedness, but I also indicate how the same general principles can be used to reverse hyperopia or farsightedness. That's the condition where you have trouble focusing on fine print or objects up close, which is something that many people encounter as they get older. I do want to correct two minor errors where I misspoke during the presentation and only realized it later. About 12 minutes in where I'm discussing a graph from a study on changes in the axial length of the eye, I mistakenly state the units as millimeters where the graph clearly shows it's microns. I did realize and correct the mistake later in the Q&A section, but in that section I also incorrectly described a condition where one eye is dominant for distance and the other for close work. I refer to it as ambilopia, which actually refers to a different condition. What I meant to talk about was a term called monovision. This talk on myopia reversal happens to be the single most popular recorded talk on our Ancestral Health Society YouTube channel with well over a million views and over 4,000 comments. The comments fall roughly into three categories. A small number are from skeptics who don't believe it's biologically possible to reverse myopia, so they dismiss the talk. A larger number are from viewers who actually applied the technique with success, and they either reduced their prescription or they got rid of their glasses or contact lenses entirely. And then there's another group with questions from people who are interested in trying out the technique but they're unsure about certain details. And so for them, I created an FAQ post on my blog that answers many of those commonly asked questions. And I've put a link to the blog post and several other references in the show notes. I hope you'll enjoy watching or listening to the talk. You can leave comments or questions on the YouTube version of this podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, how many of you wear Glasses or contact lenses? That's a pretty good percentage of the audience, all right? 
So we're going to be talking about your eyes today, and I hope you'll find the talk uh, interesting. But I'd like to start out with two pictures. Uh, both of them feature myself and my daughter. The first one on the left was on a merry-go-round at the San Francisco Zoo when she was about a year old, and the one on the right was more recently. And you might notice some differences between the picture. Well, I'm beside the fact that my hair is gray. Uh, I was wearing glasses in the one on the left about uh, 20 years ago. And so part of the talk today is my story about uh, what I did to learn about uh, myopia and how I got rid of my glasses. But the talk really has two parts. The first part is going to be about the causes of myopia, and you really have to start there if you're going to be effective in reversing myopia. And the second half will be uh, a technique that I've developed, and it's similar to techniques that others have developed, but it's my own particular twist on it, on how to use active focusing to reverse myopia. The photograph there shows uh, some girls in uh, high school in Singapore in a language arts class uh, using their iPads, and you can see that all the girls in the class are wearing glasses. And in some of the Asian countries like Singapore, myopia is, uh, is very prevalent. So first of all, what is myopia? Well, it's colloquially uh, nearsightedness. And what it is biologically is a refractive defect of the eye where when you're looking in the distance, uh, distant objects uh, appear blurred because uh, the images are focused in front of the retina rather than on the retina. It's really a, a very common disorder, probably the most common refractive uh, error of the eye, and it's becoming more prevalent. And severe myopia can lead to macular degeneration, cataracts, eye floaters, uh, retinal detachment in serious cases. So it's something to be concerned about. Now, my talk's about myopia, but some of you are farsighted and have hyperopia. It's the opposite condition. Uh, I had to focus the talk, so I chose myopia because it's more common. But a lot of the principles here, if you, if you pay attention, apply to hyperopia as well. So question is, uh, is myopia caused genetically or is it environmental? There's evidence uh, on both sides. Uh, for example, twin studies and, and, and parent-child studies show a higher correlation than you would get uh, with fraternal twins or just by chance. There's a number of gene mutations that have been identified, like uh, SCO2, which is a, has to do with copper metabolism, which are implicated in severe myopia. And there's wide variation between different ethnic groups. So for example, it's much higher in Asia, you know, 70 to 90% in some countries, maybe a third of people in the US or, uh, uh, or Europe have myopia, and it's much less common in Africa. On the other side, there's a lot of environmental factors. So for example, there's been a large increase among Aboriginal peoples, for example, Eskimos, once they were introduced to Western schooling. There's a correlation between achievement level in school or academic level and myopia, and there's some experimental demonstrations that uh, defocus uh, generated by close work is a cause of myopia, and we'll be getting into that in some detail. If you go back some of the early studies on myopia, there's one from Holland in the 1880s looking at military recruits, looking at the occupations of where people came from when they were coming into the army. And if you looked at farmers and fishermen, it was about 2.5% uh, prevalence of myopia. If you looked at leather workers who used their hands, coarse work, maybe about 5%. Hand workers who were doing fine work, perhaps jewelers, it jumps up to 12%. Merchants who were doing a lot of uh, you know, accounting work, paperwork, 15%, and advanced students about a third. So that was some indication that there might be a relationship between the kind of activity you're doing and the incidence of myopia. If you look more recently, myopia has really increased since 1970, all right, in all age groups. And what this shows here are different age groups from youth to uh, my age, where the incidence and prevalence of myopia has almost doubled, and the gray and black show the incidence of the more severe or advanced types of myopia, where you see a, particularly a large change. 
Uh, so if you look also at Aboriginal peoples, I think a good example is Eskimos. And this was a study done by Francis Young in 1969 in Alaska. Uh, if you look at the incidents by age group, it's very interesting because in 1969, there had been a school in operation for about 30 or 40 years. So those folks who were older than 40 had not had Western education. And you can see there's virtually no incidence of myopia there whereas those had, who had been introduced to Western schooling had, in some cases, more than 50% incidence. Again, some evidence of a, an environmental factor. If you look at Germany, there was a study done just recently uh, where uh, people who did not complete secondary or vocational education had maybe you know, 20, 30% uh, or 20% myopia. Those who completed their secondary education, it bumped up to maybe 35. And then those who completed university, more than half of them had myopia. And there's some geographic uh, distribution that indicates um, countries where, um, particularly in Asia, where there's more schooling. Even at young ages, like seven to nine, we see that in uh, Singapore, for example, 34% myopia, whereas Nepal, it's only 3%. And that compares to a modest maybe seven or 8% in the US, again, in school children. So uh, there's another environmental factor, which is diet, all right? And uh, there's some studies, particularly by Cordain, showing that, uh, for example, eating a lot of carbohydrates, not surprisingly, might induce a higher incidence of myopia. And it's been tied to uh, hyperinsulemia, to excess carbohydrate intake, to a deficiency of fish oil and essential fatty acids, and to uh, mineral deficiencies. Now, Cordain took the view that actually genetics were not that important because he was studying uh, children in the islands of Vanuatu who were in school eight hours a day, and yet they only had about 2% um, myopia. But, you know, as I'll argue later, it's not genetics or environment, but I think the two come together. And if you, if you think about it in terms of epigenetics or environment acting on the genes, it's kind of like alcoholism, right? You can have a gene for predilection to alcoholism, but if you're not exposed to alcohol, you won't, you won't have that condition. Well, there was a study done by Douglas Frederick in 2002 showing that uh, if you had the, the genetic uh, indicators for myopia and you engaged in practices, myopogenic practices like education near work, uh, you could get strong myopia, more than two diopters. Uh, whereas if you're not predisposed and you had those habits, you, you might get some milder myopia. However, if you had practices that were non-myopogenic, basically uh, either a low le level of education or occupation that didn't involve a lot of near work, uh, there was either mild or no myopia. It's a very interesting paper. So let's get into the biology. You know, how, how can you explain this? All right, so I think it's important to start with uh, an understanding of how the eye focuses light. If you look at the eye, uh, it has this lens in it, the crystalline lens, which just as in a camera, can change shape to focus uh, light on the back of the retina where you perceive the image. Now when you're looking at distant objects and, and most of the rays are coming in parallel, the lens is fairly flat, and so there's not much focusing needed. However, when you're focusing close up, the lens actually has to expand and, and become more curved. Um, and just like with a magnifying glass, you'll tend to be able to focus the light. Now, a healthy eye can go back and forth between those two focusing states rather easily. However, what happens in, uh, in myopia? It really is a process that develops in a couple of stages. So first of all, you know, as we saw in the previous diagram, you have a thinned lens when you're looking at far objects, and you have a thickened lens when you're looking at near objects. If you spend a lot of time working on the computer, or reading, or looking at your smartphone, after a while, you'll, the, the, uh, when you're doing near work, the lens will spasm. And it will be much harder for it to thin out again when you look in the distance. So now when you look in the distance, rather than focusing on the retina, you're focusing in front of the retina and you perceive a blurred image. So this can be transient, you know, and this is what happens when you 
uh, might be in grade school, but if, you, if you're doing a lot of near work or you're looking at your smartphone all the time, that spasm becomes more permanent. And so you go to the optician and the optometrist and they fit you with minus lenses, which are convex lenses. And when you put those in front of the eye, it sort of has the effect of making it look as if you're seeing things in focus when you're looking in the distance and all is well. However, there's a problem here because that distance correction now causes focusing behind the retina when you're looking up close. And this induces a very interesting process, and I'll get into the biology of it, whereby the eye elongates and the axis of the eye gets longer. All right, and it has to do with a biological mechanism having to do with defocus. Now, when the eye elongates, uh, all of a sudden, the eye is longer. This is fine when you're doing near work where you're spending most of the time. However, you, you get the same problem as you did with pseudomyopia in that you're now focusing in front of the retina and those images are out of focus. So what do you do? You go back to the optician and get a stronger prescription and the process repeats itself over and over and over again. And this was my experience uh, where I had to get stronger and stronger prescriptions in order to see in focus. So there's a theory called the incremental retinal defocus theory. And this was uh, developed by Hung and Chiafretta. And there's some very interesting recent data in humans showing that if you actually fit a, a person with a, uh, a minus lens, right, the axis of the eye will grow. And here, in just the course of an hour, the length of the eye has increased by more than five millimeters, which is significant because the eye is only 25 millimeters long. On the other hand, if you put a plus lens in front of the eye, over the course of an hour, it will shrink right, by about 10 millimeters. And if you just put a neutral lens on, there's no change. Now, this is a study in humans. Uh, this is very recent. A lot of the older data was in primates and in chicks. But this is exciting because they now have tools using a, a photometer where they can actually measure uh, the length of the eye when you're focusing. And this is, I think, pretty interesting proof of what's going on. So what's actually happening is that uh, when you're fitting the eye with this lens and you're focusing behind the retina, uh, there's a process by which there's a growth of scleral tissue. And the scleral tissue grows in response some, to some neuromodulators that are secreted when there's a defocus. Um, it's, it's actually quite interesting. It's been experimentally demonstrated. So these neuromodulators increase the elasticity of the scleral tissue and allow the eye to elongate. The same process, by the way, can happen in, in uh, hyperopia where you're focusing uh, in the other direction and you can cause the eye to become shorter. So let's see if we can put this into a practice. Can we take this learning and turn it into actually a method for reversing myopia? I mean, there you saw an experimental demonstration how actually putting a lens in front of the eye can change its shape. So in this regard, I'd like to touch on a, a key principle that I write about in my blog, Getting Stronger, and that is hormesis. Hormesis is a beneficial response of an organism to a low-dose stressor that's otherwise detrimental or lethal at high doses. And it works by activating various defense or repair mechanisms. And there's a lot of examples you might be familiar with, for example, uh, exercise and immunization, calorie restriction, exposure to hot or, or cold. These provoke an adaptive response. UV radiation, phytonutrients, formation calluses. If you play the guitar, go barefoot, you get the growth of skin there. And I will argue that active focusing is also uh, analogous to uh, uh, exercise in this respect. Exercise, particularly weightlifting, is a great example of hormesis, right? If you're lifting heavy objects, you're causing uh, these micro tears, uh, micro trauma to the muscle, and you, pr you get a super compensation as a result. As long as you don't overdo it, uh, your muscles will grow back stronger. The key is you've got to do training optimally at, by working at the edge of failure. If you Overtrain, you'll damage the muscle. If you undertrain, you don't get a response. And this is sometimes called the specific 
adaptation to imposed demand or the said principle. Uh, so how can we apply this to reversing myopia? But first, imagine that you walked into a gym and you wanted to get stronger and you applied the same model that an optometrist did. Now you go into the eye doctor and what they're giving you when they give you a pair of glasses or lenses is essentially a crutch, right? You want to have immediate satisfaction and see things crystal clarity right away. You don't want to do any work. Well, if you went into the gym uh, and instead of working out, they said, here, we're going to put an exoskeleton on you. And this is not a joke. The, there's a defense contractor who's actually proposing this for soldiers who have to go on long you know, hikes and training missions that you would wear this uh, exoskeleton. And as you move, that would amplify your muscular strength and it would make life easier. Well, what do you think would happen if you wore this exoskeleton all the time? Right? Probably the same thing that happens to astronauts in space. Their, their muscles atrophy, they get weaker, and when they take off the exoskeleton, the problem's even worse. Well, my argument is this is exactly what you're doing when you're wearing glasses. You're weakening your eyes. So let's talk about then how we can apply hormesis to make your eyes become less myopic. Well, there's a few techniques. First of all, um, there's uh, print pushing and plus lenses, which you use while you're reading. Secondly, there's, uh, for distance, there's the use of progressively weaker lenses or fusion of ghosted images, which I'll talk about. So you first have to understand how myopic you are. And the best way of doing this is to use a Snellen chart. You're all familiar with this if you've gone to the DMV or if you've gone to the eye doctor. It's a series of letters with different lines, and you stand 20 feet back and see how far down you can read. So if you could read down to... Uh, line four there, or line, let's say line five, the PECFD, you would have 2040 Snellen score, which means you can see at 20 feet what a normal person can see at 40 feet. And if you can only read the E at the top, well, then you've got a problem. But if you translate that into the prescription you'll get, so if you look at that 2040 person, uh, they, they uh, might get a prescription that's about 0.75 diopters, which means they could see normal-sized text about 52 inches in front of them without glasses. All right? So you first have to know your strength. Now, here's where the interesting thing comes in. It, if you really want to work on reversing your myopia, you have to read without glasses. If you have... Uh, so I'd like to distinguish three different distances. And this is my daughter acting as a model here in front of the computer. So you're sitting at the computer or a book and you're reading. Take off your glasses now if you wear them and hold some printed matter in front of you. All right? Hold it at a distance where you can see things just in focus. And pull it in. That's D1. That's what I call the edge of focus. Now push it out just a little bit further until it just starts to blur. You can just see that beginning of blur, and that's what I call the edge of blur, and that is D2. Push it back a little further away, and it starts to become indistinct. That's too far. That's the edge of readability. Well, this is analogous to when you go into the gym choosing the proper weight, right? You want to pick that weight that's putting you right at the edge of discomfort. Now, what you want to do is uh, if you're, um, let me go here is move back and forth between D1 and D2 while you're reading. And just keep pushing it a little bit. And you'll feel that it's a little bit discomfort, a little bit uncomfortable, but never painful and never difficult. And so you'll be reading between D1 and D2. And do this for about two to four hours every day. Take a break every 15 to 30 minutes or so. And eventually what you'll find is you can increase D1 and D2. You can push it a little bit further away. Maybe the second day, you'll get another inch away. All right? And keep, keep doing this. Um, you'll be surprised, actually, by how quickly it works. Once you get to 20 inches away, if you can see that, you're in great shape. Now you need to use plus lenses. All right? So if your myopia is strong, you don't need to use anything. But if your myopia starts to get weaker, now you use plus lenses. So here's what you do if your correction is a little bit weaker. Uh, if you need, if you have a correction of like less than 
minus two diopters. You go into the pharmacy and you'll see these racks with readers and you might try on the plus one or the plus 1.25 or the plus 1.5. Pick a, pick a uh, pair so that, so that you can read comfortably at you know, 15 to 20 inches. So now you're actually starting to handicap yourself. This is like going for a run carrying weights, right? And you're gonna get stronger faster this way. Uh, you might buy several pairs, and as you get stronger and stronger, you might be up to a plus two. Now you're gonna find that as you look at the distance, everything is starting to get clear, and that's pretty exciting. Keep going and keep ch ch testing your Snellen you know, every week to see if you can read further and further down on those lines. Okay, what do you do when you're not reading? Say you're going for a walk, watching TV, you're sitting in, in, in a room like this, and you want to improve. Maybe you're riding as a passenger in a car. I wouldn't advise this when you're driving, all right? So what you do there is you get weaker lenses. So let's suppose your prescription is for a, a minus three, right? So get a minus 2.5. Now maybe your optometrist is cooperative and we'll, we'll do that for you. But if not, go to uh, online, go to zenioptical.com, put in your prescription and you have here some frames, about $7, and with the lenses, it might cost $20. Order yourselves a few pairs of progressively weaker. So if you're at minus 3, get a minus 2.5, get a minus 2, get a minus 1.5, and then as you get better and better, move down to the weaker lenses. Okay, now, now I'm going to talk about a technique which is really fun and very playful in the spirit of Daryl Edwards, and this is a real story. How did I actually discover this technique? Well, I was vacationing, and I left my glasses at home on the other side of the, of the U.S. So I was without glasses for two weeks, and at first I was very frustrated. I'd brought some good books to read, and my eyes were all blurry. So I went for a walk and said, okay, I'm just going to see what I can do without glasses. What I noticed is that when I looked in the distance, particularly at objects that had sharp contrast, like the edge of a building, or overhead telephone wires that I could see a crisp image and then I saw next to that a very faint secondary image. And this is sometimes called diplopia or double vision. It's not a serious problem unless it's in a single eye, which you, then you should see your eye doctor. But generally it's just a refractive issue. When, you're, when your eyes are, have mild myopia, not very strong myopia, you'll see these two images. Sometimes you'll see more than two. And it's really just an a refractive uh, uh, phenomenon. But it's actually quite useful because the more you stare at this, you'll find that one of those two images is darker than the other, right? And as you keep staring, you'll find that one gets darker and the other gets lighter and fainter. And eventually, it fuses. And this was a very exciting discovery for me, that by looking at distant objects, particularly with high contrast, I could start fusing the images. So this was my method for active focusing and looking in the distance and the plus lenses for working at the computer. Okay, so there's some, some key questions here. Does the method really work? How much time should I spend each day doing this? How long before my vision improves? And is this the same as the Bates method? Well, a couple facts. First of all, it worked for me and for really dozens of others, and I write a blog gettingstronger.org, that's had over 1.3 million views. Uh, there's two posts in particular that I encourage you to look at that have to do with vision improvement. Uh, one of them is called Improve Vision and Throw Away Your Glasses. And then I have a forum where there's a thread called Eyesight Without Glasses, and these have you know, over 100,000 views. And also, I'll show you some uh, slides with references at the end of the talk, uh, and they'll be on my website if you're skeptical or if you want to follow up on the science behind this. How much time should you spend at it? Um, first of all, you've got to have the right mindset. These are not exercises that you do, like going to the gym. These are activities you integrate into your daily activity while you're working at the computer, while you're at work every day, or while you're going for walks. Spend at least two to four hours print pushing without plus lenses if you have, mild myop if you have strong myopia, and with plus lenses if you have mild myopia. And take breaks, it's very important. Don't sit there looking at the screen all the time. Look in the distance, look up close. Look, look near, look far. Um, 
Key point, again, it should feel awkward, but never painful. If you do get red eye or strain, stop. Take a few days off, try it again. How long does this take to work? That's the other question I always get. Again, be patient. It took years for your eyes to get into this condition. It's not gonna change overnight. How do you approach exercise, going to the gym and diet? You don't expect immediate results. You've gotta work at this. However, keep in mind that you're gonna see clearly um, and that's gonna be exciting. I mean, the one thing I have to say here is that this was the most exciting thing for me to be able to take off my glasses and see everything in crisp detail, to see expressions, to see the leaves on trees, fine little you know, branches, to see little patterns in the, in the sky that I'd never seen before. If that doesn't motivate you, I don't know what, what can. It's just incredibly liberating to be free of your glasses and not to have contact lenses. So typically, most people see some improvements within a few weeks, and the rate of improvement is generally faster in the beginning. Uh, it's common to see a sudden improvement and then no change for a while, and then a sudden improvement, but that's the way it works with going to the gym, right, or losing weight. It's not a steady line. But again, the excitement comes at the end when you don't need glasses anymore. Is this the same as the Bates method? Well, not really. Bates had a theory that he, you need to relax the eye, and he had a, a faulty idea of physiology. He thought that focusing the eye's muscles had to do with uh, muscles that surrounded the eye tensing or relaxing, and that you were actually changing the shape of the eye. Well, we now know that's not the case. It's the ciliary muscles and the crystal, changing the shape of the crystalline lens. I mean, he was probably right about uh, eye strain and uh, uh, the fact that you need to relax. However, he only addressed really half the problem, which is what I call pseudomyopia, right? That initial period where you're not being able to see in focus. He really didn't address axial myopia because he didn't know that the eye would get longer or shorter. And unfortunately, his methods of relaxation and distance viewing, they're great, right? I think they're fantastic. But they really don't do anything for those of us who are sitting at a computer all day. Right? Because you can only spend a certain amount of time looking in the distance. And what we know from the incremental retinal defocus theory is that it's kind of the time averaged exposure to different focal lengths. That's important. So if you're going to be spending a lot of time at the computer, you need a technique. And that's where the print pushing idea comes. Right, Holding the piece of paper or the screen at that right distance, not getting too close, not relying on your lenses but working right at that threshold between focus and blur, focus and blur. It's a very tiny threshold and you can find it pretty easily. All right, so that's what Bates didn't offer. Okay, so I would like to summarize. Your eyes are adaptive organs, just like your muscles, just like your metabolism, just like everything about you. You've been reading close up for years. You've been working with smartphones. Those are a particular problem with kids, right? They're, they're looking at their smartphone or their video game all the time. And as a result, your lenses are in spasm. You need progressively stronger lens prescriptions to correct that problem, but that only makes your eye get longer and your myopia worse. So reverse the process, do the opposite, right? Use that same adaptability to reverse the process and use active focus. Take time out from your busy routine, look at distant objects, move back when you read. If you're sitting watching a TV program, sit as far back as you can. If you're in a lecture hall, sit as far back as you can to see everything without your glasses. Um, if your myopia is weak and your eyes are getting really good, use plus lenses to accelerate the process, all right? And when you take those plus lenses off, you'll find, wow, everything is really crystal clear. So stimulate your eyes. It's very important, play with your eyes. Have fun with this, this is not a chore. Build it into your daily life, make it a habit, but make it a game. When you're walking along a trail, look at every little branch, right? Trace those branches. Look at the shadows, see what you can make out, right? There's a, this wonderful world around you, you're not, not noticing but a fraction of the details, and it's just so stimulating to be able to do that without your glasses. 
What I can tell you is the more you do this and the more disciplined you are about doing it, the better your results will be. Um, so anyway, that's all I have to offer you today, and I'm um, happy to take questions. Uh, first, before I take questions, I just wanted to flash on here some references um, on the epidemiology and on the biological mechanism. All right, this will be on the video, and you can take a snapshot. And finally, on, on methods that you can use to improve your vision and some websites, I particularly recommend uh, uh, the DeAngelis book and the Severson book and Otis Brown, really good uh, uh, methods. In my site, uh, gettingstronger.org, Fraunfeld Clinic, Power Vision System. These are all good sites that have similar uh, methods. OK, we have uh, time for 10 minutes. Want to take the first one? Uh, yeah, I was, thanks. That was uh, really interesting. I was, I was wondering, um, do you still have to do these types of exercises now, or are you just kind of cured? So just uh, as you would uh, when you're fit, you go to the gym every so often, right? Um, I would say periodically. I, I have a pair of plus lenses if I'm reading a lot. I'll pull them out and use them f for a bit, but not very much, actually, because what I tend to do is just sit back a little bit further from my screen and try to avoid the bad habits in the first place. Um, with the screen being such a potentially negative um, part of the environment, um, I noticed that the, you know, the, your daughter was modeling in front of the screen. Is it better to try to train with books um, and not look at screens? Um, is there a certain volume of you know, time to look at a screen, um, considering how much you said the the, the smartphones and the computers are damaging our eyes? Yeah, I think it's preferable to have a well-lit uh, book in front of you would be ideal, but sometimes you don't have that option. So if you are doing computer work, uh, I don't see any real difference as long as you have good lighting um, and uh, you're healthy. You can okay. use a computer or a book. Thanks. Uh, okay, so it seems that in my family, we run myopia. My brother has two eyes that are around 21,000, so he just can't do anything without glasses. I have an unusual problem in that this eye is perfect and this eye is really myopic. When, when I go to the Snellen charts, I can't read the biggest letter anymore, but the problem is that I remember what it is, so. <laughs> Uh, so, you, so your two eyes are different. Very different. And this is, by the way, very common. It's called ambilopia. I have it too. In fact, I have one eye that's slightly farsighted and one that's slightly nearsighted. So here's what you do. Uh, well, uh, uh, right. I, if you have the, t the two different eyes, uh, block one eye and work with the weaker eye because your stronger eye is going to dominate and do more work for you. You can put a patch on your glasses. You can just hold your hand like this or you can wink, right? <laughs> wink from one eye to the other. And it's awkward at first, but your winking muscle gets stronger. Yeah, because I have 20-20 and 2400. Right. So I find that it, my problem is I can read right here, and I can read right here. And it's only like right here that's difficult, because my eyes are not used to vying for dominance. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they don't like that. Oh. So I should probably read a lot right here, so my eyes get used to seeing three-dimensionally. Would that be? Yeah, but your eyes are so different, I think you probably want to work your yeah. weaker eye first until it gets closer, because it's much easier to do this method when your eyes are close. So in my case, it was my left eye that was weaker, and I spent a lot of time working that until the two were even. So would you have some advice for my brother, who would probably have to be about this close to the computer before he could be at the edge of readability? That's tough, but that's where you start. <laughs> Maybe his nose will get in the way. Yeah. Now, that, that's where you start. One thing he can do is use weakened prescription. So cut a few diopters off the prescription so that you're at a reasonable distance. Uh, in this case, it would be a minus prescription, but just weaken the prescription and start there. Great. Thanks. For someone with a really strong prescription, if they go through this process, are they going, are they going to have to replace their glasses along the way? Because it can be pretty pricey. Yes, and that's why I recommended this website, zenioptical.com, very inexpensive frames. You know, get several pairs for $15 or $20. Frames or glasses? Uh, are they 
about six dollars for the frames, and with lenses, it might be twenty to thirty dollars total. Okay, thanks. Similar question about uneven. Like, I have a minus six point five and a minus five. Do I work on, like, do I just do like a do a like a negative six and leave this the same, or do I kind of step them both back at the same time? I mean, how do you work with this, you know, without yeah. the blinking thing or whatever? You know? Yours are pretty close, so they might work. But if you want wink or, or block the stronger eye and work with the minus six one first until it's down to a minus five. And you can, you can use the, smell, the Snellen chart there too okay. with a single eye, you know, read as far as you can and wait till your eyes are more even and then they'll proceed together. It's just like, when, what if you went into the gym and you had one, a strong right arm and a weaker left arm? You, you would want to work the weaker arm first until they were both similar. Right, so I could get glasses that I only am stepping down one lens for something like that. Yeah, I get those. or just put a patch in, or a diffuser oh, a patch, in front I of see, one lens. I see. Okay, thank yeah. you. Hi, um, I was just curious to see how much your axial length has actually changed since um, doing this method. Unfortunately, I don't have the device for measuring my axial length. That, that requires a sophisticated apparatus. However, the study that I cited there, uh, uh, you can read about 28 different patients and, and see all of the measurements that were made on their eyes. But typically, if you look at the, um, the results that they got, it would be by several millimeters. Uh, so I saw. Or, sorry, in, I'm sorry, I, several microns, yes. Okay. Um, so I think one of the things that your method teaches is um, improving your uh, visual acuity and not necessarily um, changing any of the optics of the eye, which, is, um, which can help. But I just want to um, say that it is the, the optical issues that are in place um, are not being. Uh, corrected for. It's just improving your visual acuity through practice. I just want to say that. Yeah, if you have other eye conditions outside of, you know, myopia, uh, yes, this doesn't deal with those. Thank you for a very insightful talk. I, I have a question about the font size when you're doing this. A lot of people, especially here in the Bay Area in tech, are using bigger font size where they're staying at the same distance. Um, so would you still recommend um, even if you use a bigger font size to move away from the screen, is that a... Right, obviously there's a connection between font size and distance. So the recommendation here was for normal size font. If it's larger, you would have to move back farther to get the same benefit. So being, being on a short distance, even, if, even um, despite using a bigger font, the problem is focusing on a, at a short distance. Is that correct? That's right. So you, okay. want to, you want to increase the distance, whatever the font size is, by moving back farther and farther progressively. Thank you. Um, if you have kids who have 20-20 vision, how do you prevent them from ending up with glasses like I have? <laughs> yeah. Good question. So first of all, good hygiene, which means don't work too close up, right? Work further away. But if they want to do that, they can go buy weak plus lenses like the plus ones, the readers, very inexpensive. Just go into any pharmacy, they're there. And if they're doing extended work, have them wear those. A lot of people look at this as a preventive technique. And uh, do an experiment. Have them put the plus lenses on and read for an hour and take them off and ask them, do you now see the world more crisply and clearly than you did before? Just ask them. Thank you. OK, I think uh, two more questions. Um, I've never had an issue with myopia, but I'm getting to a point where I need glasses to read. Um, and, and more recently, um, driving at night is less comfortable. I'm wondering any ideas around, around those two issues? I think the two go together as you age. It's, it is, you know, your, your vision does deteriorate, and it's harder to see things at night in particular. Uh, one thing I didn't touch on is, you know, good diet. I think that helps a lot in terms of a, a low insulin type diet, um, and also plenty of... Uh, phytonutrients to make your, have your rods and cones healthy so you can detect color in low light. But I also just think that these methods of, uh, of, of, of healthy focusing are going to be helpful at night because you'll see the car lights and the details that you need to see more crisply. So same, same principles that you The same about. principles, yeah. Okay, thanks. Final question? What would happen if people kept going after their vision became normal again? Would it continue improving? Ah, there's one post on an interview that I did on my site with a, a student who had poor vision. He got to 2020 and he said, I want to do better than this. I want supervision. And he got himself down to 2015. 
Um, go on my, it's called How One Person Improved His Vision or One Person Improved His Eyesight. And he used the method to get all the way to 2015. And if he kept going like that, would that create the opposite problem for myopia? Ah, no. I mean, so you can, you just get better and better distance vision, right? But you can use the same process for hyperopia. If you cannot see things uh, that close up, then you, and you have to read like this, then do the opposite. Pull them in. Pull them in until they're at the edge. And eventually you'll be able to read more, more close up. You basically can change the shape of your eye in either direction by using active focusing. Right. So would continuing after it was normal, like after myopia, myopia is fixed, create hyperopia? Not necessarily, no. I mean, because it's, it's right, you're, as long as you're flexible and you're able to exercise your eyes so that you're looking both close up and in the vision, and I, I advocate alternating the two, it's, it, it increases the range of, of focus from near to far. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I got a question. <clears throat> Um, if you improve your myopia using your technique, do you think that's going to reduce your chances of macular degeneration? Uh, it, it may. If you look at some of the causal contributors to macular degeneration, retinal detachment, eye floaters, you'll see myopia listed prominently there. It's not the only cause, but there is a connection there. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health Today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.